Welcome to the How to Find and Keep a Gay Man podcast. I'm Matt Bays, your host, with Matt Heinker, your co-host. And we're here to provide bitchy wisdom for the gay man looking for love. There are a lot of gay men out there looking for a meaningful love experience, and we are here to help. You can follow How to Find and Keep a Gay Man on Instagram and TikTok, where you'll find all sorts of bitchy wisdom about what it's going to take to find and keep a gay man. Welcome. We're glad you're here. I love all these necklaces you've been wearing. This is my Mexican silver. Love it. <laughs> Thank you. I was um, looking at some of your pictures and I was telling Christopher, I was like, look at nails, jewelry. These boys must be gay. We do it all. I love it. Yes, honey. Right. Welcome to How to Find and Keep a Gay Man. Today, we are going to talk about therapy, all the different aspects of therapy. How, why, who, when, what, all of it. (laughs) We're going to get into it. And we're not just going to tell you to get a damn therapist. We're going to talk pretty practical insight on what that looks like, why we do it, and how it has impacted our lives and really been a game changer for both of us. Now, these two mats you're listening to, we know each other very well and intimately are aware of each other's stories. And so we know the impact that has been made through therapy on each other. And that's why I think we're such big proponents of it. Absolutely. I I was telling Ty, we were preparing for this this week and I was talking to Ty about it last night. And I really, as I've really thought about it, it is not an overstatement to say that I would not be in the relationship that I am in now without therapy. And I would not be a healed and whole person at peace in my mind and body today had it not been through therapy. It was the most important part of my journey and continues to be. You know, I've said in a lot of the past podcasts that the work is never done. It is never done, but it is the most important thing you can do for yourself. And then the fruit of it, you know, allow you to grow into this person that's able to find and keep a gay man. So we say get a damn therapist, but we almost say it tongue in cheek at times, but it really is the foundation of our message. And we wanted to take time to talk specifically about that for everybody today. And Matt, the therapy that we are in today does not always directly impact every decision that I'm making right now, but we are building all of these tools. When I started therapy, when I was 21 years old, because I had a lot of shit to sift through, I was (laughs) building all of this stuff in my life over years that I am making decisions today based on that therapy back then, even though I wouldn't have been able to make the decisions while I was in that therapy back then. Do you know what I mean? I do. That's a really good point. We're Mm -hmm. learning, learning all along the line. All of this stuff builds and gives you new muscle uh, that's going to be able to even impact future decisions. And beyond new muscle, it gives you perspective that there is no way that I would have been able to arrive at by myself. So we're going to get into that. So first of all, this floored me. 47%, nearly half of Americans believe that seeking therapy is a sign of weakness. Still. Still, that was 2021 um, via Statista.com. So here we are, (laughs) this highly evolved, woke, educated society, and half of us think that therapy is for weak people. We have to believe (laughs) that it is actually for those who are strong enough to deal with their shit and move forward better and different. So we've got to change culturally our mindset on it, particularly in our community. But the stats for the gay community even works only 24% of white gay males in the United States are in therapy currently. Only 15% of African-American gay males are in therapy and less than 11% of Hispanic gay males are in therapy. So you see the stigma attached to those cultural communities reflected in those numbers, but collectively only roughly less than one in four are in therapy. And we know that more of us than that need it. Now that just pissed me off. Yeah. Now I'm angry. <laughs> Like, I can't even imagine thinking of somebody who's not in therapy, like they've got it together. We just know that that's not how our world works anymore. We should know that. Get your ass in therapy. However, I wonder sometimes if this has to do with people who are in therapy and never seem Mm -hmm. to change. 
I think that there's probably a good chunk of that. Mm -hmm. Um, We're going to touch on that a little bit later on, you know, you have to do the work when you get into it. So it's not going to be this, you know, salvation for everybody unless you engage in it. But for whatever reason, we're still culturally dealing with that. And then one step further, the older you are in our community, the lower percentages of those people are in therapy. So only 6% of gay men over 45 are in therapy. Oh, well, they don't need it anymore. (laughs) Probably the ones that need it the most. (laughs) So you're saying men that are my age, only 6% of us gay men are in therapy? In the United States, correct. As of 2021. Yeah. Uh, And Dr. David Burns was commenting on these statistics. He's a gay psychotherapist. He says it's not uncommon to meet fellow gay men suffering from anxiety and depression. It's also not unusual that they are unaware, in denial, or unwilling to recognize these challenges or take steps necessary to address them. We are informed as a society, particularly in the United States, by toxic masculinity and are socially programmed to go it alone. Minority stresses are something that we've talked about that in previous episodes. We, mm-hmm. The stigma attached to being in a minority as a gay male, you carry that with you. The result of it is internalized homophobia, all kinds of issues. And additionally, gay men are more expressive growing up and they've been targeted their entire lives. So a lot of the wounds from those experiences prevent us from really being able to be vulnerable um, Mm -hmm. in a therapeutic session. So those are some of the things that he points to in creating that kind of, you know, dynamic that we're living in right now. At what age did you start therapy? I did not start therapy until my late 20s, 27, 28. And why did you start? Well, I was hideously depressed and I couldn't figure out why. <laughs> okay. And again, I've talked a lot about my background, but growing up in an uber religious conservative environment, being taught that gay people didn't even exist. It's an expression of the fall or a sin issue. Mm-hmm. So here I was wrestling with who I really was. And I first had to believe that I was actually a gay man. It took years of therapy for me to break through that. All you but I always ask me. I wish that you were around. I would ask you could have saved me years and lots of money. Have we yeah. ever even said on this podcast that when we met each other, we were both pretending to be straight? <laughs> and both of us looked across that table at each other like, hi, darling. Maybe we can talk later about what's really happening. Cute shorts. Where'd you get them? Yeah. <laughs> so I was like, oh, God, I love those shoes. I didn't know we could wear espadrilles. <laughs> Those culottes are so tasteful. He looks like a spring summer breeze. <laughs> he smells like one, too. Is that white shoulders? <laughs> oh, oh, man. We've come a long way, baby. Mm-hmm. You were much younger when you started, though, correct? Yes, this is what happens when you grow up in abject abuse. <laughs> <laughs> you start, I started therapy. Actually, it was over issues of sexuality. I was 20. And I was in college and had a run in with a boy today. I look back on it fondly, but not (laughs) then. Uh, Then it was a source of great shame and great emotional and spiritual duress. And I went looking for help. You know, on my campus, there was a, a therapist there that I started seeing. And she was a Christian therapist. So she was not leading me toward authenticity with myself. Exactly. She was leading yeah. me toward whatever I told her, which was, I'm straight, but I have homosexual tendencies. Oh, Lord. Yes. Same. It turns mm-hmm. out real big ones. You know? <laughs> yeah. And so she was like, OK, well, you're probably on the spectrum. You know, sexuality is a spectrum, blah, blah, blah. Well, later I found out the spectrum. If this is a spectrum, here's me over here at 100 percent all the way, <laughs> all the way gay. Oh, yeah. You know, yeah. But yeah, I began then and then periodically over my life was beginning to dig into my issues of abuse, how I had arrived at being me, why I was having panic attacks when it seemed that there was nothing wrong, why I just couldn't seem to hold it together, you know, and, and have some sort of peace in my life. Uh, Absolutely. Yeah. And I had the, the exact same experience in different directions. And I, I think the panic attacks... You grew up in the church, you talk about the fruits of the spirit. And then my breakthrough came when the fruit of this tree is death. It yeah. is me mentally ill, seeking to self-medicate in any way that I can. Mm-hmm. It is me having panic attacks. I was like, my body is telling me 
that I need to move in a different direction. And so how do I do that? I needed help to do that. And that's when therapy started. Yes. And Matt, not everyone is going to have panic attacks. Not everyone is going to get fired from jobs or have broken relationships. Those certainly can be the consequences of not being a whole person and a healthy person, mind, body, spirit. But Mm -hmm. for some people, it's just the simple question of, are you happy? Exactly. In who you are, in the state of life that you are, are you happy? And if the answer is no, then we can start digging because some people have not like us. They came out at, you know, 15. I mean, there's kids coming out at nine years old now. Yeah. And so they haven't had that war, maybe. But there are still some of those people that are unhappy and can't seem to find what it is that they're looking for in life. And when we go to a therapist, we don't always know what's wrong. Right. Mm -hmm. So we go and we begin asking questions. The first guy that asked me about my panic attacks said, what's wrong? And I Mm -hmm. said, nothing. And he goes, well, your body does not agree with you. Your body does not agree. Exactly. And you need to help figuring out what that was. You were that. Oh, my God. Yeah, Yeah. I didn't know. You need a professional. And I'm a pretty intuitive person. Sure. But more about others than about myself. I needed help to figure out what was happening inside my body. One of the most beautiful parts of your Uh, vows with Ty was when you said, and I'm making this decision in full integrity with myself, mind, body, spirit. It was Mm -hmm. something to that effect. I make this commitment fully in integrity with myself at peace in my mind and body for the first time in my life. Yeah. It was magic to say that. And I meant it. Right. So I can have issues swirling around me now going on in my life or whatever, but this person is at peace in my Mm -hmm. body and in my mind and have been for the last six years. And so dealing with issues now looks a whole lot different than it used to where I was self-medicating with Mm -hmm. alcohol. Uh, I was never much of a porn guy, but my God, I love to sit home and drink in isolation. Everybody go to Mm -hmm. bed so I can get my drink on, you know, (laughs) and that worked right up until it didn't. Yep. So Dr. Burns, the guy that started off with some of the stats I I mentioned, he has three reasons why, you know, most of us are not going to therapy. We've learned that at the beginning of this podcast. Why should we? And he has some compelling reasons and it's not, you know, earth shattering information, but I think it's good for us to unpack. So the first of us is most of us, the large majority of gay men have significant attachment issues. So, you know, we've talked about this a little bit in past podcasts, like caregivers play a crucial role in our development, but not just in our early development. They also provide a template in how we view and experience relationship. And we replicate that. And if there was abuse, either verbal, physical, or even via neglect, we developed a ruptured attachment style. It's broken in some way. And that ruptured attachment style never fixes itself, is what he says. And so I think that's really interesting. So he says, without the help of a trained practitioner, we continue unknowingly to shadow our trauma and live with the results of it via mental health conditions like depression and anxiety. So our ruptured attachment style is not going to fix itself. If we don't get help, we are going to continue that narrative. It might not look exactly the same, but we will not heal and attach correctly and be whole people. And the majority of us have that work to do. We continue to shadow our trauma. That doesn't yeah. sound good. <laughs> That's, that sounds pretty dark, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. Number two, he says, most of us are unable to self-soothe and redirect ourselves. So, you know, self-soothing is the ability to realize we're hurting, to give ourselves the comfort we need, or if we can't, being healthy enough to seek it from others, which I, th- I thought was interesting. So he says that most of us are trapped in some sort of a cycle of negative thinking. And this negative thinking can almost become this familiar, almost comforting thing. We're used to it. And so we go around believing that nothing good can happen to us. We only assign blame to others. And it's a smokescreen to manage our own real pain. And so we don't develop the emotional intelligence that you get. Those are what we talk about, the tools and therapy. Really what that is, is you're developing the emotional intelligence to see things clearly, to self-soothe, to heal your attachment styles, and to redirect, you know, a lot of this negative self-talk that exists within us all. And again, something he says that doesn't happen by itself. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the last one he said is gay men suffer from some level of shame, low grade fever, all the way to debilitating. Society teaches us that our sexuality is abnormal, perverse, and even morally wrong. Psychologist Alice Miller chimes in and says that invalidations as we grow up, no matter how small they seem, can inflict psychic wounds. If we believe what we are told, again, we perpetuate insecure attachment styles and then often seek to self-medicate to deal with that. And how many stats have we looked at, you know, in the last few weeks, the the statistics of, you know, how much we're self-medicating through drugs and alcohol and whatever else in our community. And so that is us not having really good mental health experts helping us along our journey to heal those things. These are the realities that we have to face. And these are the reasons why we over and over again say, get a damn therapist. It will be the lifeline for you to rebuild your life in a healthy way, maybe for the first time. In my case, that was what it was. Finally being able to build a foundation from which I could stand, like I said in my vows, at peace in my mind and body for the first time in my life. It yeah. would not have happened without mental health yeah. experts around me. Yeah. Now, Matt, I have shared that I worked in ministry in churches for years. And I think pretty much everybody knows that when you work in ministry and in churches, you don't make a lot of money. So sure. when it was time for me to seek out therapy, it definitely was an issue of like, how am I going to work this in the budget? I knew that it was important, but it was something that I was going to have to figure out because I had two kids I was raising, a house payment, car payment, all the things. How am I going to afford this monthly? Am I going to go once a month? Am I going to go every two weeks? Am I going to go every week? You know, this mm-hmm. these bills pile up. Sure. I've heard a lot of people talk about that. Like, I just can't afford it. You know, therapy is expensive. I just can't afford it. I would like to talk about that. Let's discuss that, shall we? Yeah. All these yeah. gays with no children can't afford it. <laughs> Well, listen, there are plenty of gays out there. And this was a surprise to me because even in a book like The Velvet Rage, which I love that book, I remember reading it and thinking, where the hell are all these rich gays? I don't know them. You know, it just <laughs> was, was like we were lunching on our yacht in Ibiza. Yeah. Always. All of his, all of his it examples. Was a, this anesthesiologist I was talking to. It was always <laughs> something that was like at the yeah. height of the food chain. And I just thought, I don't know all of those people. I know a lot who are lower income or middle of the road at best trying to figure out how to make it work. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that, like they don't know how to do it. Uh, Or they don't know how to make it work financially. And I have some thoughts about that. But I want to ask you first, like, what are your thoughts about that? Or has that just not been an issue for you? I have a couple of thoughts. I think, first of all, um, how much money are you spending up at the club every month? How much money are you spending on Grubhub? How much money are you spending on moisturizing products and clothing and shoes? I mean, gay man, we're, we could be doing the most a lot of the time. So I think, first of all, it's a matter of where your priorities lie. Mm-hmm. This has to be a priority. We already talked about why. Second of all, I'm a group health insurance broker. If you are employed the large majority of the time, you have mental health services at discounted rates, or even there's a section of free mental health services through most people's employee assistance programs. If you work for an employer of any size, you can get six to eight to sometimes 10 of your sessions free to begin with. Mm-hmm. And then beyond that, they have a sliding scale to place you with a therapist that is maybe conducive to the budget that you have. There are resources available to most of us as employed Americans um, mm-hmm. through that. And I think it's more of a priority more than financial restriction most of the time when you really get down to it. Yeah. I was thinking about this and was realizing that over the years, I've paid nothing when I was in college. I've paid as high as 275 for therapy and got great therapy for it. I've also paid as little as 40 and $60 mm-hmm. an mm-hmm. hour. I remember filling out that paperwork and it asked, what is your annual income? Sure. And I wrote that down and ended up getting therapy for 40 dollars once and another time for 60. And then it went up to 75 when I got a raise. I mean, that's pretty manageable price yeah, and because sure. the therapist worked with you based on your income. Sure. And I've watched people also negotiate while they cost $175. I ask them if I could pay 125 For sure. And a lot of therapists will actually work with that. You just got to ask the question. And as you mentioned, like how much are you spending on moisturizer? 
listen, we're not trying to be assholes. This might sound like the bitchy wisdom part, but the truth is what's most important. We absolutely have to prioritize mental health above being out in the club. Or if you go to the club, girl, take your canteen. I don't know. (laughs) You're, you're not drinking that night. You yeah. know, you got to get real serious to get to that point, but hopefully we're going to inspire you to be this serious about it after this podcast. The one other thing I would add onto that again, is someone who works in insurance, I'm currently in therapy right now. I practice what I preach. I see my therapist at least once a month still for maintenance. And because my employer provides United healthcare health insurance, they pick up a chunk of the cost, I only pay the difference. So if you have group health insurance or health insurance of any kind, there's going to be a network of therapists that subscribe to that or accept payments from that to offset the cost as well. So we want to look good. Moisturizer is important. Go to the club and have fun. But there is a way to get quality therapy if you're serious about it. Yeah. And you know what, Matt? I think it's worth mentioning too, that just like any sort of eating program, if somebody was trying to get more healthy, physically fit, that not every program is going to be right for you. It's a fit is very important. And with therapy, I've heard countless people say, I tried it, meaning once. Yes. And I didn't like that therapist. It's like, well, there's a whole lot of therapists out there. And fit is very important. I think give it more than one session. Mm-hmm. You know, but to me, I know in three, actually, I, I have an idea in one, you know, <laughs> because I've done so much of it. Yeah. But anymore, what I've noticed is I've gathered so many tools over the years. I don't need a rock star therapist. I mean, I don't need goodwill hunting level therapy. I can go to a therapist that may not be the most talented therapist in the world but I know how to do that work because I have those tools, but it's still important for me to sit before somebody, say the things and have them mirror some of that stuff back to me. Does that make sense? It totally does. Yeah. You're, they're inevitably going to show you things or talk to you about things that you are not able able to see yourself, which is so important. Um, But I also say that finding a therapist is very much like dating. You're going to typically have to see a couple before you find the right fit. Don't be discouraged by that. That's very normal. And if you feel like I got this therapist, I'm not comfortable. It's a man. I don't want to see a man. Then don't find another therapist. It's kind of knowing yourself, but you have to give it a shot and you have to shop around. There are two therapists, only two that I can think of. And I've had probably six over the years, two of them where I went searching for somebody else. One guy I kept when I was going through my big breakup, I did not really connect with him. And he was a gay guy. It was the first time I ever went to a gay therapist. Mm -hmm. I didn't really connect with him, but I still saw him for five sessions until I found somebody that I could switch because I needed something. And at least that was something to keep me working and him Mm -hmm. giving me homework, which we have to get into that. Yeah. I kind of a similar thing. I was going to, (laughs) I was going to a therapist with a faith background and I needed to break up with that therapist because they were never going to allow me to take steps to move forward, being proud of the gay man that I am and to make the difficult decisions that I was being faced with in my life at that Mm -hmm. point. So I did the hard work of finding a new one. I found one that was kind of bossy and very prescriptive. I'm an Enneagram 8. That energy made sense to me, and it worked. I'm still with this therapist. She's a dear lady. The chemistry, the relational dynamics were correct. I immediately felt safe with her, and she was the one to do transformative work in my life. So you know, she's a kick your ass therapist and you like that. You know, it's not everyone's going to like that. I've referred people to her and they're like, well, mom was too rough. And I'm like, okay, you need to find one that matches the style of care that you need. hundred percent. You know, yeah, yeah. and people don't understand that. That's a really important part of it. You know, the, the yeah. relationship with the right therapist should feel deeply reparative and safe. Yeah. That's when you know you're with the right one. Yeah. If, if I have a therapist that is sending me home with scads of busy homework, write all this shit down. No, I'm not in school anymore. But what I don't mind is the go write out your story. And sometimes that takes longer. If somebody gives me one job to do, uh, I'd like to talk about this next time, then I'll do my homework that way. But if I have just a bunch of busy work, that's not for me. But some people love that stuff. So it is very much how you're wired that's going to help you kind of achieve higher levels of uh, healing. Yeah. Well, and let's get into that because I think that's where a lot of people fumble the ball too. So maybe you found one that you like or that you're comfortable with. 
you know, you've gotten over the hump of even going to a therapist on a regular basis. But when you get work from a therapist or they give you homework to model or act out in your own life, you've got to do it. Right. Talk to us about that. Oh, God, this is my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> this is called do the work. I have known people who have been in therapy with the same therapist for years. And I want to hunt their therapist down and say, light a fire under their ass because they're <laughs> not changing. And yeah. it's not the therapist's job. It's my job to show up. I mm -hmm. drove 50 minutes to see a therapist because like I said, at the time, she was $40 and I did not have the money to be paying $275, right? Yeah. So I drove 50 minutes and Matt, that drive there and the drive home, I needed that three hours because I spent 50 minutes preparing to go mm -hmm. in and not yeah. waste a half hour blabbing about stuff that didn't matter. So sure. I thought I'm going to get my ass in here. Here's what I want to talk about. And I'm going to start minute one with mm -hmm. hello, Hope your week's been good. Here's what I've got to talk about. And that's what I would do. And then we would talk through all the shit. And when I left, I would get in the car and I would drive 50 minutes home in the quiet processing. Mm -hmm. Now I had a shit ton of family abuse and all of the stuff to sift through, mm -hmm. but it sure. was one of the most important times of my life. And that drive that I took gave me time to do my homework. So mm -hmm. what seemed like it was going to be really inconvenient just wasn't, but you have to show up. You have to be willing to do the work. It's not going to do you any good to just go. It's like going to the gym and wandering around aimlessly and sitting down at a couple machines and sort of, eh, but you're not really yeah. putting your back into it. Exactly. You no, know, you got to get your ass there. You need to have a plan. This yeah. is what I'm working on. So if somebody says, what are you talking about in therapy? You should be able to say, this is what I'm talking about therapy. Absolutely. In my situation with my therapist she gave she was very prescriptive again that worked for me but she literally gave me books that she wanted me to read and that's pretty heavy lifting not a lot of people mm -hmm. are willing to read a book i was so desperate for change that i read every book she gave me and i tell you what each one of them were designed for me to read yes. and they were very very helpful they created turning points in my life so yeah. if your therapist tells you if she says read a book mm -hmm. read the damn book take notes and discuss and then in the last episode, I talked about probably the most important thing. I've been through years and years of therapy. Probably the most important thing to me now is that dialogue of self-love. That is a sacred practice of mine mm -hmm. to stay centered mentally. And I learned that from this therapist. Yeah, She said, write down these things about yourself. How do you feel about this? Recite it. Find quiet time in the morning at least. And very prescriptive. Not everyone's going to respond to that much structure, but... My point is I'm, I'm backing you up on saying that they're going to tell you to do some things so you can create dramatic movement in your life mentally. And you've got to do it. I have this crafty ass friend always doing all these amazing things. And I remember her talking about one time how much, you know, she had added water to paint to like water it down and was painting like fabric, like a couch. And I was like, what the <laughs> hell? Like, who does this? But anyway... <laughs> I was going to paint a room in my house. I didn't have much of this paint left. And I just texted her and said, how much water can I add to this paint? And she just texted back, depends on the level of desperation. <laughs> and, I, and when you just said, I was desperate for change, we call it rock bottom in the program yeah. of a recovery. Your rock bottom is how desperate are you for change? You know, and we've all heard that we're not going to change until staying the same becomes more painful than changing. Changing Absolutely. is not easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of courage. But there is a point where staying in this space that I'm currently in is not working for me. It's working less for me than going out and doing something like change, getting a therapist and working towards something better. Now, some people will just resign and be like, this is all it is. I'm dead inside. I'm mm -hmm. done. I'm just going to yeah. sit here and live out my days. And they might find people to commiserate with them and give them that stamp of approval that oh, yeah, this sure. is just life. No, we can be happy and we can have good lives. Your negative patterns of thinking become a sick comfort. That's what we said earlier in the podcast. And how many circles of friends do we have that have never been to therapy or really taken it seriously and experienced breakthroughs in their lives? And they sit in circles of bitch fests. This is where I'm going to sound like you know? an asshole, but I'm yeah. going to give you a few times to come to me. 
And if I keep hearing the same damn story and you keep telling me that you are still not in therapy, I'm not going to unfriend you. And there are people out here that may listen to this that be like, oh, I've actually heard him say this, where I'd say, I'm not going to talk to you about this anymore. We can talk about anything else, but of yeah. this, I'm not going to talk yeah. to you about it anymore because you're not doing anything about it. So it's pointless. It's a waste of your time. It's a waste of my yeah. time. I'll tell you what, I have dear friends, dear friends around me uh, that I'm in a relationship with. And it is painful. Not that I have everything figured out. I'm still on my journey as well. We all are. But but it is painful for me to see people that I love continue to just hamster wheel through the same bullshit yeah, and not yeah. move forward. We want people to find and keep your gay man. We want people to, to live lives as whole, beautiful gay men, showing up for who they are, accomplishing yeah. the things that they're capable of and that they're destined to do. For me, this is such a personal topic because I became a whole person because of the therapy that I went through. And we, we talked a little bit before this call about maybe sharing key breakthroughs. And one that really sticks into mind is I just started to come, going to see this therapist that I'm still with today. And I lived in a beautiful home on the north side of Indy and left that home, left all the furniture, left everything there. I wanted to be the least amount disruptive to the family that I had still living there. And I moved into this cracker box bungalow that needed a lot of work in the broad ripple area of Indianapolis. And I sat down in that house the day after closing and just absolutely lost myself. I had a nervous breakdown. I was in so much pain and I did not know how to move forward. I knew that I could not stay in the place that I was. I had to live authentically. I had to come out. I had to live as a gay man and in that moment, it felt like it had cost me everything. And in a lot of ways it had. Um, but my therapist, um, I saw her literally the next day after I first moved in there. And she said, lift your head up. She said, you are not a villain. You are not a bad person. You are a person of worth and you deserve love. This woman, I'd lost, everyone was gone, my family included. And this woman who in that moment was one of my only caregivers told me that I was worthy of love and I was making steps toward healing. She says that broken bone has to snap back together so it can heal. And that's painful. And do not allow yourself to believe in this moment that you've done something wrong or that you have to explain yourself to someone. You love everyone around you to the best of your ability, including yourself, and you move forward with your head high. And these are some things that I want you to think about every morning. And I tell you what, I will never forget that day. It was a huge step forward for me to begin to be a whole person. And I, I could not do that on my own. It makes me emotional thinking about it. I, I could not have done that by myself. And now I look at my life and look around me today, not, not even four years later, I cannot believe how far I've come, mm -hmm. but I did not do it by myself. Mm -hmm. So that is why this, is, this message, get a damn therapist, is so near and dear to our hearts. It is the foundation for you to move forward in ways that you could not have imagined. And I believe that with all of me. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to see our way forward. Mm -hmm. I am so grateful in this moment, Matt, not just for the steps that you've taken and that you had the courage to move forward, but for therapists who are able to, without batting an eye, tell us the truth look at us yeah. and say, you are worthy of love yeah, and you belong. And by the way, hold your head up. Hold your head up. Yeah. You know, because we carry this, you know, we may have made previous commitments, you know, in our marriages or whatever it might be, yeah. or we may have thought we were able to pull something off that it turns out we weren't able to, mm -hmm. but we don't have to be ashamed. Yeah. We just have to make amends, mostly with ourselves, mostly and move forward. Ourselves. You know, yeah. that's yeah. beautiful. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. So here's my big, ugly story. <laughs> and, and the funny thing is, this, this was not with a professional therapist. This was with my sponsor in recovery. And, you know, you would think at 46 years old, I would just know that I was gay. But listen, <laughs> when you have told yourself this lie for so long and you're able to have sex with a woman, you think you're not sure. Maybe you're somewhere in the middle. You've sort of turned off this part of your life. And I remember 
putting down on a list things that I needed to work out. And on the list was my sexuality. And he said, well, I'd like to talk about that. And I said, uh, oh, God, we don't need to talk about that because I've been trying to figure that out since I was 18 years old. And I now know that I'll never know. Oh, my. Wow. Jesus. That makes me sad to even say that because I yeah. cannot believe that that's where I was. And he said, yeah. I would like to talk about that. <laughs> I don't think it's that hard to know. And yeah. I was like, okay, I was open. I was like, okay, well, we can talk about it. He said, why don't you think you can know? And I started thinking about it. And as I began to talk, I was talking about, here's what's going to happen if I'm gay. I'm a part of a church. I'm going to get turned out into the street. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I am a part of a family. I'm going to get turned out into the street. You know, I'm going to hurt all these people. I'm going to hurt my children. Yeah. You know, this can't be true. <laughs> I can't afford for it to be true. <laughs> no. And he said, here's the thing, Matt. The truth is just the truth. That's all it is. Mm -hmm. And the consequences do not inform the truth. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> I felt like I couldn't breathe when he said, it. Yeah. Yeah. the yeah. consequences do not inform the truth. And he didn't even seem overly serious about that. He just kept saying, it's just the truth. That's all That's it true. is. And he said, so here's what I want you to do. I want you to get in a room alone with God, whatever you conceive that to be. And I just want you to ask God, yourself, the spirit world, the universe, what is the truth? Yeah. And I said, well, if that's the case, I know exactly what the truth is. And he said, what's yeah. that? And I said, I'm gay. I've always been gay. And he said, okay. <laughs> he said, well, let's sit with that information for about a month. I just want you to carry that information around in your chest with it. You don't have to tell a soul. And I said, okay. And I said, but does it mean I have to get divorced? And he said, it doesn't mean anything. We're not even going to get there one step at a time. Yeah. It doesn't mean anything, honey. It just means it is. It That's is. all. Now, Matt, it's one of the most defining moments of my life because it's the first time I remember leaving him and I went to the mall because, you know, I love to go to the mall. I don't <laughs> shop at the mall, but I walk those damn malls. And I got to that mall and I was walking around. Nobody was there. It was mid morning. And I was walking around for the first time in my life, in my own head, quietly repeating over and over, you are a gay man. <laughs> you are a gay man. I am a gay man. I am a gay yeah. man. And I just kept thinking about that and the levels of freedom that I felt. Now, what was to come that I didn't let myself think about because he said one step at a time, we're just sure. going to stay here and hold on to this truth. Let's not get into what it means or what it's going to change. We're sure. just going to hold on to this truth. We need a minute with this. I didn't sure. let myself go there. I just stayed right in this spot. And you were right. It was a bumpy road. And this steps outside of, for people listening that may have not had this experience that you and I had, this steps outside of sexuality, that when we uncover truths about ourselves through these therapists, it takes our life and redirects it. Yes. It's like riding a ship that's on the wrong path, mm -hmm. you know, and we find Absolutely. new levels of freedom, new levels of ambition. Mm -hmm. new levels of emotional health and relational health and spiritual health. Everything can change. But in recovery, <clears throat> one of the things that they always say is, and remember this, if you don't remember anything else, if you're starting this journey, it's painful before it's peaceful. Okay. Yes. Count on it. Mm -hmm. We got to hammer that home because I think that's another place that people get to and kind of give up. You have to be willing to look at those really painful places that you've been ignoring for a long mm -hmm. time. Matt, and to see them with new eyes, because we think mm -hmm. we already know what happened. There are people out there listening to this. I'm just going to say whoever's listening to this, you think that you've done things that you have not done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are people who think that they've done these awful things, but they're still seeing themselves through the eyes of an eight-year-old, not being able to look at it as a full-grown adult and realize 
that I didn't understand something about this story. And mm -hmm. that's why we need a therapist to help us see that in a new way. Those moments, we talked about one. I have so many that were just pivotal for me of being like, holy shit, I have not told this story true mm -hmm. ever. And I've told this story 52 times. Yeah. But I've yeah. always left out a part because that part left me feeling culpable, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'll tell 95% of this story. Mm -hmm. But darling, the problem is the 5% is where the lie lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That part has to be told if we are going to get healing. And that's where our therapists are rock stars. And if the they lies. can get us there. And if we and do the work. My therapist says, because the lies and the secrets keep you sick. Yeah. You know, only yeah. as sick as your secrets. That's right. That's and right. darling, it's painful before it's peaceful. And the problem Ooh. I see with this, Matt, is that people who don't do this work, a lot of them, a lot of gay men turn into assholes. Yes. And that is why we need to redirect this belief that therapy is for weak people. It's for strong people. Mm -hmm. It is for somebody who is courageous enough to go into the eye of the storm of your life and survive it and move forward differently, finally heal from it. It's for people that are, are ready for change and are courageous enough to pursue it. Because you, you know, this stuff, if you leave it inside and don't talk about it, it comes out, it comes mm -hmm. out, it mm -hmm. will find its way out. It's mm -hmm. going to tell the story somehow, mm -hmm. you know, so you'd like to be in charge of that, but how it comes out is sideways yeah. through addiction and through Anger. And that's a lot of it. You say a lot of angry gays out there. Ooh, yes. That are they're mean on the apps. We've talked about all those bad behavior things. Those are yeah. all effects of unresolved issues. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. The end. The end. Do your damn work and get a damn therapist. We want you to live in peace, not peace, this honey. Right. You, you can't get there by yourself. Period. And I mean it. I love that you just said that because that is my new life phrase for everything, period. I mean. <laughs> Dr. Reverend Silky, what you got for us today? I've been looking forward to the prayer time. I'm sure all the children have as well. Lay it on us. Listen, we talked <laughs> about the pain coming out sideways, and we talked about how it can make some of us assholes, Matthew. Mm -hmm. So I'm calling this prayer the asshole effect. <laughs> Dear everybody. If worthiness, love, and connection are the symphonies of Carnegie Hall, the asshole effect is boots on the ground, drag all the instruments into the venue. There's no symphony without the necessary preparations. The asshole effect is practical as hell, and it is necessary. That said, don't be an asshole. And if you know that you are, don't see a therapist about how to find love. See a therapist about how to stop being an asshole. The kind of love you're hoping for isn't coming to you if you're an asshole. So solve for that first, hot stuff. And if you know it's true that you really are an asshole, don't beat yourself up over it. So you're an asshole, but you've got your reasons. Once upon a time, something happened to you, and in order to survive, you channeled your anger, or built up walls, or shut out people closest to you. For a while, it even worked. It doesn't anymore. And this behavior has left you feeling insecure, broken, and alone. It's time for a change. Change requires unlearning the patterns of behavior you've used possibly for decades to take the edge off of life's disappointments. Change is part of the deal. It's not going to be easy, but with help, you absolutely can pull off this sort of prestidigitation. So believe, pull a rabbit out of a hat, wave your magic wand and begin. Decide in the here and now, I'm going to get help. I want to love someone and I want them to love me back because I am worthy of love. So what's next? Get a damn therapist. 
and begin <laughs> to get clarity so you can move closer to finding and keeping a gay man. Amen. Amen. And amen. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, Lord, I'm exhausted. That was a lot. I want to finish by saying this. What we are after here is to see people, the lights turn on for them yes, and to yes. see them move into new places where they feel healthy, happy, and whole. This isn't fun Absolutely. and games here. This is serious shit. Mm -hmm. And that's what we want. We want people to find love and to find healing. Am I Absolutely. right on that? Oh my word. Amen, honey. Absolutely. That's the reason for this work that we're doing, for sure. Yeah. And until next time, live in rivers of self-love. Living. One, two, three, four. That's it for us today. For more bitchy wisdom, follow How to Find and Keep a Gay Man on Instagram and TikTok at, you guessed it, How to Find and Keep a Gay Man. And until we meet again, get a therapist, don't be an asshole, protect yourself, call your mom, and remember that you deserve a meaningful love. Bye.